Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me and my special guest today on another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. Uh, this one, I if you've been following me on Twitter, you probably know I'm real excited for this one. Uh, it's going to be a really cool topic, but also I'm, I'm quite honored to have the guest today, um, Paul Reed. For those on Twitter who follow any military history, First World War especially, you know who he is and everything that he's done. Um, he's got over 30 years of experience, actually more. Now we were just chatting uh, more than I've been alive. So that's that's pretty, pretty powerful uh, for someone like me to kind of get to talk about this and, and then bring this to you. So it's it's something I'm really looking forward to. So what we're going to be talking about today is Canada. Uh, we've got a kind of title to Canada Corselet. So that's on the Somme. And which carries everything with it, the baggage of what that word means, but also the Canadian role towards the end of the fighting on the Somme. So it, it's a bit different. So we're going to look at some different stuff. Like I said, there's some great photos here, uh, you know, from the period and that Paul's have taken and kindly shared with us. So it's, it's, it's really good. And I'm really, really excited for this one. Hey, Paul, thanks for joining us. How are you today? Hi, Brad. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm again really grateful for you coming on. Um, it's it's an exciting topic. I think it's one that gets lost in the you know Canadian shuffle. Um, I'm sure we'll get to that, but and yeah. I'm sure you have some thoughts on that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Of, of course, a lot 1916. So um, I just I guess we'll start off kind of what's your connections uh, to Corselet and how did you kind of come to this topic and kind of the depth of knowledge that you have on it. Uh, well, I mean, f firstly, I mean, back in back in the 80s, I, I was always interested in the Canadian Expeditionary Force for a number of different reasons. Um, I used to come across a lot of material in Britain relating to Canadian soldiers in junk shops, photographs and medals and all sorts of other things. And I thought at first I was a bit curious about this. You know, why was all these Canadian um, military and memorabilia and so on, what was it doing in Britain? And that was, of course, when I realised that such a high percentage of Canadian soldiers in the Great War had come from Britain. They'd been born there and, and emigrated before the war. Yeah. And um, and these were stuff returned to their family when they were killed on the battlefields of the of the Western Front. And um, I discovered that there was a Canadian veteran living not far from me, a guy called Lance Catamol, who'd served with the uh, with the twenty first um, Battalion. And um, I went down to see him a few times, an amazing guy. He was a professional artist. Um, and he'd gone to Canada with his two brothers and joined up underage. Um, and uh, and he ended up fighting at Corps Select when he was only 16 years old. Hmm. Uh, and his mother didn't even know he was in the army. And after the battle, he wrote to his mother and said, Dear Mum, I've just been in the Battle of the Somme, or you know, words to that effect. And she kind of freaked out and contacted the Canadian War Office and said he's underage. And they wouldn't discharge him because he was, he'd said he was 18 when he joined. Uh, but they sent him back home to, uh, to, the, to the UK, and he ended up in the Canadian depot at Seaford um, and then Folkestone for pretty much the rest of the war. And when he was 18, um, he was called forward for a draft and this was just after the beginning of the Battle of Amiens when mm. Canadian Corps casualties were ramping up because of all the attacks that they, they were making and they were sending drafts out left, right and centre. Mm -hmm. They were also worried about, because of the Russian Revolution, they were worried about Bolshevism in the, in the army, not just in mm. the Canadian army, in every army. Yeah. And they, they actually interviewed guys to, to find out whether they were Bolsheviks. And I don't know what sort of questions they asked. Them, <laughs> it sounds like something out of Black Adder. Are you a Bolshevik? Yeah. Deny, deny everything. Um, yeah. What's but, your favorite uh, tool, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, so he went into this interview and the guy sitting at the desk uh, had the collar badges of his old battalion. But he couldn't see his face. And when he looked up, it was his old commanding officer. And his name, Catamol, was quite an unusual one. And this officer said to him, Catamol, he said, Catamol, don't I know you, Catamol? And he said, yes, sir, I serve with you at Corselet, sir. And he said, you've done your bit. And he signed a chit and he never went. Uh, so it saved his life, really. But yeah. because his war was only Corselet, he had a couple of months in the salient before that. But... Mm. Um, that's what he talked about. So I, I developed this great interest in Corselet, and then so he sadly passed away a couple of years later. But <clears throat> jumping on a bit, um, 
one day in the early 90s, I decided I didn't like the job that I was in and I was going to pack it in and go to France and write a book um, and be there for three months. <laughs> and Ten years later, I was still there. Uh, and uh, and I ended up living in Corselet, so it kind of sort of went from there. So I lived in the village for a decade, and I met a lot of Canadians walking the battlefields there and researching the battlefields there. And I had a good friend in America, Tom Gummerstead, who um, had every Canadian battalion history, and he very kindly photocopied all the pages wow. um, for Corselet and sent it in this big folder. So <laughs> I had all this stuff, and then I could read, you know, like a chapter from the – Grenadier Guards of Canada or the Royal Highlanders of Canada history in the morning and in the afternoon walk out to the exact spot that I was talking about and, and walk that bit of ground. So it was it was quite something. And then living there, the, the war was very, very much literally on our doorstep. So the PPCLI dug in in our garden and uh, on the night of the 15th of September and mm. I used to find bullets and, and uh, cartridge cases and shrapnel balls and stuff in the vegetable patch and stuff like that um and one day uh one of the farmers came to the door um having discovered the body of a of a canadian soldier uh, mm. in, when they were clearing a bank at the back and um it was late at night the commission couldn't come down couldn't leave the body out on the battlefields um because believe it or not there'd been examples where collectors had come along and stolen bodies to try and get the yeah. stuff off of them. I've heard so that brought, many, unfortunately yeah. many times, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, a, it's a sad aspect of, you know, the way the Great War, you know, became popular, I suppose. So yeah. we went and recovered this body and brought him back home, um, and he stayed in our house for the night and was probably the most honoured guest that I'll ever ever have <laughs> yeah. in any house in which I'll ever live. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then the commission came the next day and, and took the remains away. Um, you know, that, that's 25 years ago now. So, uh, you know, things are somewhat different in the recovery of human remains on battlefields now, rightly so. But that was yes. kind of the, the ad hoc nature of it then. So, yeah, so it's been a, you know, a long time interest. And as I mentioned to you earlier, you know, Canada has run through my life, my interest in both world wars a lot. So it's always been there, really. Yeah, and I mean, I was yeah, joking to you too that, that we kind of Canadians, that's kind of our thing. I mean, we seem you know, to weave our way into almost many aspects <laughs> uh, history. I mean, celebrities, whatever, we're always seemingly there. But uh -huh. yeah, but anyway, this is a, a topic that is really interesting to me. Like I was talking to you before, I've been here, I've been to this battlefield. I didn't get the full experience that I thought I was going to get, not because of any of the tour guides or anything like that. Like I was telling you, the weather was some of the worst that the locals had ever seen in the area. Uh, I mean, we were hearing that in, in Arras, and, and, and we went into, of course, the just very briefly, but the weather was that bad. They're saying, yeah, this is awful. And we couldn't really see anything. So I didn't get the full experience of kind of walking the lines like we had with other battlefields. Like in, in the salient, we saw everything but this not so much so this is kind of one of the reasons why i'm excited to kind of to get you know pick your brain in the format of this but also sharing it with everyone because i think your knowledge is unparalleled but you're just that personal connection you have to the canadians and, and of course all that and everything it, it's amazing so we've got a little uh powerpoint here that we're just going to kind yep. of move through and use to chat and, and and all that kind of stuff so we'll get that started up cool and i will say your photos are amazing. <laughs> they, uh, they put anything uh, that I can do to shame. I mean, you said, yeah, it takes the patience, but you've had the time, which is, which is. Yeah. Uh, um, well, well they're, they're, I mean, I, I, I take them on a, on a, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I take them on a, a variety of different bits of kit. It's uh, everything from, you know, iPhone through to Nikon. Um, yeah. it's, 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 it's more about just seeing a landscape and connecting with it and, knowing where to stand as well. I think that's one of the big things with photos. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that, that's kind of something I try to do with my own stuff is, is, is keep the context in mind. And I think you do, a, well, I know you do an amazing job with that. So yeah, so this oh. is just kind of our, our start off here. So I was wondering if you could kind of just talk about what we've got going here. Sure. So the village of Corselet, um, a typical uh, French Somme village right in the, the heart of what became the 1916 battlefield. 
it's well one of the nice things is the the, the som archives have digitized their censuses now so you can go on mm. and you can see what the the census was in these different Vassom villages, um, which is really, really interesting. And there was about 300 or so people living in Corselet, so it wasn't a massive uh, village. That went down to about 100 or so just after the war. And when I lived there in the mid sort of 90s for a decade, it was about 130. So like a lot of these rural French villages that were on the battlefields of the Great War, it never really recovered from a population point of view. People dispersed. They just didn't come back to these places. Um, but it was a prosperous village. It was built around farming and a number of farms, dairy, um, but crops as well. And um, that's the church, which is right in the centre of the, of the village. And it had two chateaux. Um, the the bottom one is the one owned by the mayor, Monsieur Gons, and his grandson was the mayor of the village when I lived there. So that continuation of the Gonses was still going on, sort of you know, eighty wow. years after the Great War. Wow. The Gonses fled to the French coast, and they lived in their summer house for the course of the war. Mm. Um, but he got a knock on the door one day from the war office. Um, in the approach to the Battle of the Somme when they were mapping the Somme area for the mm. forthcoming offensive. And he gave up a lot of information about Mouquet Farm, which he owned, and also mm. the village of Corselet. And they produced two one to 5,000 maps of Mouquet Farm and Corselet, which were quite unusual. And they, he's actually mentioned on them as being the source of the information as to what the cellars were like and where the wells were and all that sort of stuff, which is quite unusual. Mm -hmm. that that chateau the one at the bottom was destroyed quite early on because it was n facing the allied lines first the french mm -hmm. who were, were in that sector and then eventually yep. the british but the top one is the more interesting one and that's the red chateau as the canadians called it and that became a headquarters chateau for the germans and also a medical station and it had a massive cellar underneath it the chateau was destroyed during the final course of that, but it was continually used by the Canadian Army Medical Corps. And there was a cemetery established there as well during the battle. We'll come back to that shadow yeah. with another picture of it later on. Um, yeah. So that was typical of the sort of village as it was at that time. And um, Cour, C O U R, it's minus, it's T, but there's a lot of these strange pickety words. It means um, uh, it's, a, it's a derivation of an old word meaning Roman encampment. Oh, so, right. so the, the basis, and it's just off of a Roman road, Corselet, the Albert Bapome mm -hmm. Road. So its origins are Roman. And in, and in those decades, that decade or so that I lived there, aside from Great War archaeology in the fields, we would find much older stuff, you know, Roman pottery and, and all sorts. So the history of that region, you know, over millennia uh, is mm -hmm. everywhere, basically, is everywhere. Yeah, that, then that's really interesting. I mean, just coming back to the to the to the, the, the chateau there, then the other one that was destroyed, or the one that was the HQ and then destroyed. That one comes mm. across in numerous accounts that I've read about the the, the red brick that kind of sticks out, uh, yeah, literally, <laughs> you know, in, in the ground, and that's a, a, yeah. a part that's talked about um, from the Canadians yeah. who fought there. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, Canon Scott, who wrote the Great War as I saw it. He was there as a chaplain, so he spent a lot of time in the in the chateau. Uh, Victor Wheeler, who wrote No Man's Land, he was in the 50th Battalion uh, as a signaller. He passed through it as well. So he's mentioned in a lot of the um, uh, the memoirs. Yeah, yeah, the, the big memoirs. I mean, I've looked at little letters. Just I seem to stumble upon them doing other things. But uh, well, like even with Canon Scott, I was doing something completely different. Went down that different rabbit hole about all about him and his son and everything. It's uh, mm -hmm. really interesting. But uh, anyway, yeah. So to me, that's just one of the things that that sticks out in in, in my mind. You know, in my mind's eye, as I like to say. About, yeah. about this particular battle. I mean, it's not the only one, obviously, but it's it's one that does stick out to me. Uh, it's yeah. just that that's what's remembered uh, from those who wrote about it. Definitely, yeah. So th that was the sleepy Somme village, and in, in August 1914, France mobilised, um, and the, 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 the men folk of the village marched off to war. Um, mm. the, the reservists, the regulars, and the territorials, of which there would have been all three, um, uh, living in the village because as a Frenchman you gave up a big chunk of your 
your adult life to military service one way or another. Um, but not long afterwards, um, Le Bosch arrived um, because the Battle of the um, of the Marne um, being fought around Paris also saw a movement of uh, German troops facing the French in the north as well. So right. in September 1914, the French and the German army clashed between Peron, Bapaume, Albert and south of, of Arras in different locations. Mm -hmm. And that essentially established the front um, as it would be leading up to the beginning of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Now, there were one or two movements of it here and there, nothing significant. Right. Um, but that, that sort of led to that. And, and that this is the unit that arrived at Corsolet, these guys, this is a, a photo book that I've got published during the war uh, by the uh, the photographic units. German divisions did this quite a lot. This is the 26th mm. Reserve Division. They were Württemberg Division um, mm. with big connections to Stuttgart. And um, the troops came here and occupied the sector at different points from um, Serre to beaumont Hamel to Chiatval to Overlers. Mm. And Corselet became their base of operations, basically, for the course of the of the next two years. So all the infrastructure in the village was really created by these Wurttemberg troops. And that picture is one of the ones that's in the book. It shows a, a, a building on the Albert Bapaume Road called Le Ballon. Uh, and it was a cafe it destroyed completely in the war, rebuilt as a cafe, and it became a favourite soldiers, veterans cafe in the interwar period. Um, remained a cafe up until about the 1980s, and then it closed. But um, there's a there's a lady who must be a hundred years old living in this building now, who's <laughs> lived in it for decades, and the bar and everything is all still in her front room, but it's just not <laughs> no longer a no longer a cafe. So Le Ballon is uh, is still there, not not with the uh, with German soldiers standing outside it anymore. But uh, there we are. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Those uh, those are some of my sorry, a bit of an aside. Those are some of my favorite stories from, aside from learning when I did my battlefield tour about the different people that live there now. I mean, just their stories are so interesting and the things they've seen and what they've been through and some of them that survived some of the wars and 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 all their funny stories. To me, it's it, it's it's great to connect. Definitely, yeah. Now it's it's just yeah, it makes for great stories and getting to talk to people about their different lives is is so fascinating. Definitely. Sorry, I'm just gonna close my window real quick. I've been having some troubles with uh, with the outside today. <laughs> oh yeah, it's got warm again here in Ottawa. It was a bit cooler, but then it got warm again. Yeah. Anyway, well, we're, we've gone from winter back to summer again this week. So yeah, uh, <laughs> that happens here quite frequently. Hmm. So the, the this uh, 26 Reserve Division photo book has got these small pictures of different locations connected with their service in it, and including several, of course, Alette. and mm. this shows uh, two that's in that particular volume. The one on the left is the, the sugar factory. Now, yes. sugar beet is one of the biggest crops in northern France, still is. Um, and every village had a sugar factory, whether big or small. And Corselet had a pretty big one. Yeah. And um, and farmers from all around would bring their sugar beet there and it would be processed and turned into, into sugar. The whole thing is far more industrialised now. So although there is a rebuilt mm -hmm. sugar factory in Corselet, um, it, it hasn't been used as one for decades. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a garden centre now, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, <but laughs> for the Germans, I don't think they actually did anything with it as such because you can see that tall chimney, which was a bit of a shell magnet one way or another. Yeah. Um, but there are photographs of them paraded in front of it at different points, so they used it for something. And when, when I looked at the Württemberg archive some years ago, there was mention of them using it um, as uh, headquarters for units, but then it got shelled and they basically kind of abandoned it. But mm. uh, the whole trench network was built around it and the building became part of the strong point, basically, that, that was there. So that's that one. And the other picture, it says it's dated September 1916, so it must be just before the Canadian attack, and it gives an idea what the village looked like at Very that particular point. There we go. Yeah, so that's that's one of the there's, – there's the church that we saw in the original postcard with its spire locked off but the tower still standing. And these are typical of the buildings close by. That one that's shown, I think, is the old is the, is the Marie, the town hall. 
mm-hmm. um, that was in a slightly different location then. And um, there was also the school, actually. It was the Maria Call. Mm-hmm. And, um, and all of these had big cellars. Everything had big cellars. The house I lived in had a big cellar where the Germans had constructed a tunnel from it into the nearby sunken lane. Uh, but that was all bricked up, and I was never never daring enough to <laughs> uncover it, to be quite honest with you, in case the yeah, house collapsed yeah. into it. So Yeah, yeah. I don't blame you on for that one. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so these buildings were pretty intact before the battle, um, but the most important feature of the whole village, aside from the trenches and the barbed wire, was the fact that these buildings had cellars, and we'll, we'll come back to that um, in, yeah. in, later on. Yeah, it's a pretty important part. Coming up. So this is an aerial photograph, and I, and I think air photos are massively underused in some respects by by historians, mm-hmm. um, and they give you a huge amount of information as to what a battlefield actually looked like at different points, and they you know they reveal a lot about what whoever was defending that position or attacking that division that position use this ground for or tried to you know overcome those issues and this shows the state of the village just before the canadian attack again um the front lines around posiers were to the right so to the west so it's it's a bit upside down this this picture mm-hmm. um and over to the left hand side uh there's a the sunken lane that runs up to the albert bapome road um, and there's a cemetery there which is a french civilian cemetery with a german extension because the red chateau when people died there, when Germans died there, they were brought to that cemetery and buried. And it is believed that as many as a thousand Germans were buried there. Wow. So it was quite a substantial German burial ground. And it appears to have been completely destroyed during the Battle of the Somme. Um, and only some of the bodies reclaimed. So uh, it could be that there are many missing German soldiers still buried on that, that spot. Right. Um, The trenches we can see above it are interesting because they're not defensive trenches, they're practice trenches. So this was a training area because for most of the you know half first half of the war, this was quite some way behind the lines, at five or six miles behind the lines, and only long range artillery could reach it. Uh, And so they built practice trenches for the Germans to to practice trench fighting and raiding and all that sort of stuff. But you can see that this picture, which I say dates not long before the Canadian attack, you can see the number of shell holes and you can see that already as the lines have crept closer from La Boiselle and Ovalers up towards Poziers and the capture of the German OG lines around the, the high point of the Poziers windmill, this is mm-hmm. now being bombarded by divisional level artillery, so field artillery as well as the, the big guns and that kind of changed the whole way that the village suffered really as a, as a consequence of it in terms of the of the destruction but the day the canadians arrived here it would have looked like a village it wasn't flattened uh it was damaged but a lot of the buildings were still standing including including the church so that brings us to the canadians i'm not i'm not going to go through the history of the battle of the somme but obviously the, the, the somme was a campaign it dates back to the end of 1915 when the newly appointed commander in chief, Sir Douglas Hay, met with the French and a joint offensive was planned. Um, Verdun gets in the way, which is another story, really, but it would lead to the British offensive of the 1st of July, attacking on an 18 mile front um, with over 100,000 men of the new army, territorials, and what was left of the regular army. Uh, they were meant to advance to places like Corselette within the first 24 hours. That didn't happen because of the catastrophic uh, failure of the bombardment and, uh, and the miscomprehension of what the German defences actually were like. Yeah. Um, and the Battle of the Somme became a typical attritional battle of the First World War, but it developed. Yeah. So having sent men in lines at walking pace on the 1st of July, believing that everyone was killed, Mm-hmm. Uh, within two weeks, we were using creeping barrages. Uh, we were embedding artillery officers with infantry units to more closely direct the use of guns on the battlefield, which were the king and queen. Artillery was the king and queen of the battlefield yep. throughout the war, really. Not machine guns, not bayonets. Artillery, that was the most important weapon, really. In, in, arguably in both world wars, maybe. But um, 
Um, yeah. Maybe oh, I mean you might have some people fighting you know, on the Second World War, but uh, but, but well, yeah, definitely but, for the first, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, mind you, there's those great Canadian books about uh, by the by the Gunner guy looking at all the the, the yeah. guns in Normandy and the Scheldt and uh, you know the, the Rhineland battles. Anyway, that's another subject. Yeah, yeah we did that <laughs> day. But, uh, sorry, I just wanted to yeah go back. I know you don't want I don't want to talk about the, yeah the beginning of the song too much, but again, I, I can't not mention the Newfoundlanders because they are part of Canada yeah. now. They have been since 1949. They were not at the time, yeah. obviously. But again, yeah. yeah, I think that's what most Canadians will know. Uh, other yeah. than, of course, a lot is is the Newfoundlanders more or less yeah. being annihilated on, on the first day, like so many other units. Uh, yeah, that's right. That, that day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean they they have the the the, the terrible distinction of being uh, of suffering the highest casualties yeah. of, of any unit that, that day, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, as, as is well known, were completely annihilated in that attack, and that that really you know was a was a nod to the the old world of warfare mm -hmm. of sending men forward with rifles at the port and you know trusting their luck. Uh, yeah. By the time of this battle, war warfare everything was was changing and of course the canadians were all part of that process i wouldn't say at this stage they were necessarily leading in that process because right. um uh, because they'd fought largely defensive battles prior to this rather than yep. offensive ones yeah but, and I, I don't think there's any yeah no objection for me whatsoever and i don't think anyone could have much objection to that because yeah this is the first one, like you said, is the first really offensive action. I mean, there's smaller yeah. offensives to retake ground kind of things in the salient and deep salient in that. But this is yeah. also the first battle. Sorry, just a quick aside is the first battle uh, where all four divisions are involved, not at the mm. same time. Obviously, that's Bimmy Ridge. Yeah. But this is the fourth divisions, and that would become the last Canadian division to enter the line. Yeah. This is its first test of battle. Not yet, not where we are here. But again, I just want to keep for everyone watching who might not know that. Keep that in mind mm -hmm. that this is when all the Canadian divisions that you know of had come through the line at one point or another is, is of course, led. Yeah, that's right. So what had happened in those months from the Second Battle of Ypres, which is effectively Canada's baptism of fire on the Western Front yeah. with the gas attack and Belo and, you know, the 8th of May with the PPCLI and, yeah. um, you know, Mauser region and all, and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. The Corps had suffered a lot of casualties, or the, the division rather, suffered a lot of casualties there. Second Division had arrived, Third Division, as you said, the Fourth Division, creating enough Canadian formations to become a Corps. So mm -hmm. that they would become a Corps um, with a British commander, Sir Julian Bing, um, Arthur Curry, who is you know, arguably <laughs> the, the best known. Canadian of the Great War. Many mm -hmm. people believe he won the Great War. I know um, <laughs> uh, he, uh, yeah. he was a yes. he was a divisional commander, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that all of these guys, uh, Canada, uh, Corselet is so important to Canada because mm -hmm. that edge that it developed as the war went on was born out of experiences like this. Yeah, um, and I think that's part of its of its importance and. Yeah. I, I completely agree that this is this is one of the places where what comes next with Vimy and Hill Seventy and and, and all of that is because of this. Yeah, and, and I, I like that's why I wanted one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you about this is because of that. I, I want, as we were saying before we went on, this is just not as well known as it probably should be. Uh, no, and Vimy and everything else gets the attention when maybe Corselet should get more attention understand why things like Vimy happen the way they do. Definitely, yeah, definitely. And and what what happened initially is that the Canadians began to arrive on the Somme in drips and drabs really. The first yeah. division came down and, and took over from the Canadians around Poziers, which you can see on the lower bit of the map there. Yeah, the Australia. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And they took over from the the, the Aussies and around Mouquet Farm and then to the other side of Poziers alongside some British guys at Munster Alley where Leo Clark got mm -hmm. the Victoria Cross for bravery in an attack on a German trench there. Um, but that were, they were kind of minor operations. And as the other units arrived, there was enough men within the Corps at this stage plus their own artillery assets. And they had a lot of British artillery assets, Indian artillery assets, yeah. and also French. This is something that a lot of people don't realise is that mm -hmm. the French um, loaned the Canadians quite a number of artillery 
brigades for for this attack and you find on the battlefield now of course a lot of french uh 75 millimeter shrapnel shells that, that don't date from the 1914 battles because there were none at Corselet actually um they date from that bombardment in the initial attack on Corselet where french guns supported the uh, the canadians and i and i'm sure there's nothing written down about this but i i have a feeling the french were keen to do this because of the french canadian connection <laughs> i'm sure of it you know uh, I, it's again yeah there's nothing written that i've seen one way or the other i mean yeah you have the the indian army units as well the lahore divisions uh guns as well but i mean yeah maybe you are right i mean that's kind of a debated topic a lot in canada is that well, the both ways, right? How did the French Canadians view France? And what does France think of Canada? It still can get quite heated a little bit. Uh, and there's a lot of assumptions, but I mean, I mean, it's distinctly possible. I mean, there was connections, right? There was mm. French citizens serving in the Canadian army. Uh, that's not what we're talking about mm. today, but th th there were some pretty high up officers who were yep. French citizens who served in the Canadian army. So it's it's distinctly possible. Uh, but again, I've never seen anything. But again, I'm not I don't no. not disagreeing with you because it's distinctly no. very much possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I think what I found in research is that there's very rarely coincidences. Things are always done for, for a reason. And, and there could be a, a very cold, easy, understandable reason that they just needed some decent artillery like French 75 to assist them. But yeah. I kind of think that it, it was unusual in these battles to have French artillery on loan it, it didn't really happen that many other uh, on that many other occasions in the battle of the somme so why mm. did it happen at corselet you know you know we'll probably never know we'll probably, probably. never know <laughs> so i mean this fabulous map from nicholson's official history i mean the canadian official history is absolutely fantastic documents um i think nicholson stands up probably better yep that's it Better than, better than Stacey, but uh, again, that's another subject for another day. But. Oh, yeah, that's for another day. And I did want to say, because I, I knew this was going to come up because of these maps. Again, I agree, completely amazing. I, it's available free online for anyone. Um, you don't have to buy the honking giant, you know, doorstop that I also have. But uh, uh, it's yeah. just, it's in the description. Uh, so, so, so check that out uh, if you do want to get it. Again, it's just a PDF free to download. So I, I suggest doing it. Yeah. I mean, written late, as you know, in the 60s, but um, I think pretty good account um, and stands, the, certainly the first war volume, I think, uh, stands the, the, the test of, uh, of time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it wasn't about, I don't think, blowing too many triumphant bugles or drums no. or anything. It was, it was more about the, the, the history of it, so, uh, which is interesting. So these maps are great because they yeah. show the dispositions and who was where and so on. And for this attack on the 15th of September, they were going to have units from uh, two Canadian divisions, uh, the second and, and the third. The first had kind of been pulled out and were in reserve and were holding some of the flanks. Uh, but most importantly, of course, they were going to be going into battle uh, with tanks because this was the, the birth of tanks. And um, I've singly failed to um, put any pictures of tanks in this talk. But, yeah, as you've just noticed, there is the little map there Mm -hmm. showing the tanks that went in. Now, as you can see, what happened here is typical of quite a lot of the tanks that day is they got stuck and yep. they broke down, um, but one went forward to the sugar factory, whose picture we saw earlier, and assisted the 31st Canadian Battalion in the capture of the ground around the Sugar Trench and the Sugar Refinery and Candy Trench, um, doing quite a lot of damage and, and proving what tanks could do. And, of course, you know, we can look back on it now. So, ah, were they? You know, many historians say they were using penny packets, but you've got to think about mm -hmm. German soldiers. They have no idea what this thing is coming out, yeah. and it's going to scare the hell out of you. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, they they did not have a name for it. I mean, we no. know everyone knows Panzer is a is is the German for tank. Well, it means armor, as we know really in German. Yeah. But uh, um, but they they didn't have that phrase. And and again, looking in the Stuttgart archives in in, in the eighties. Um, one of the words that they use is basically, it's a, it's a typical German word where they've strapped about four words together, and it, and it <laughs> describes it as an armoured agricultural threshing machine. Uh, because they just, they just don't know what it is. Yeah, um, it, it did some threshing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Not a yeah. crop, but uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's the design, right? It, it comes, it's inspired by farming equipment. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's, well, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating story. I mean, yeah, obviously you can't talk about the taking of course a lot without the first tanks. I mean, as mm. you can see, they play a 
minor role. I mean, they obviously play a big role at the sugar factory and, and what's done at that point yeah. of sugar trench. But again, yeah, it, it's fascinating in and of itself. I mean, I've only seen one First World War tank like fully in mm. my life because there's hardly any in Canada, right? We don't really, we didn't have our own separate um, thing like that. Mm. And moving these monsters is challenge within and of itself. But anyway, so mm. if you've never seen one of these things, they are impressive and intimidating so yeah like you're like sorry i'm Paul was saying the germans had no idea what was coming down on them all of a sudden these oh. giant metal monsters i think at some point that they do call them that it's like fire breathing monsters i think i've seen oh. and metal monsters and all this stuff they have no idea what's coming down at them and i mean they learn quite quickly oh. how to deal with them and, but that's later but yeah it's to me it's, it's it's a fascinating part of of this battle is it's like there's literally songs about this of how, how this is the birth of you know new modern warfare, and mm. in some ways there that's correct. I mean, Paul might disagree, but I mean, in some no, ways, no, I, th I, I think it was the, it was the shifting point. I think between you know first of July, look back to Waterloo, um, the yeah. 18th of November at the end of the battle, I think looked more towards Normandy, right. um, and I think the 15th of September, halfway through between those two points when tanks were used for the first time, is that massive step forward mm -hmm. when the war completely changes. Because the Canadians went into action here, following creeping barrages, mm -hmm. pummeling the German positions to the point where the infantry were almost on them and then the barrage lifts, assisted by tanks. They had Canadian gunner officers in with the infantry battalions to direct the, the fire. So you didn't have static bombardments that just kept moving forward, kept moving forward and could never be called back. They were far right. more flexible. And, and it meant that they could get into positions and do a lot of damage, keep the Germans down, capture the positions that they did. And, and as well, I mean, the trenches that were part of the German front line had been pummeled to oblivion almost anyway uh, by previous fighting. And mm. probably they were not much more than outposts lines in many respects right. and the, the germans as you know always believed in defense in depth and and where the, the tanks roll in that assault on the sugar factory and those positions between sugar and candy trench you know is part of that story because that is where the germans start to basically dig their heels in mm -hmm. and don't want to don't want them to be going any further but the, the arrival of the tanks and i'm not saying they tipped the entire course of the battle but right. they certainly helped in those given areas yeah of course they yeah they play that let's i say that one that makes it does have uh, uh, well the one that comes to sugar factory does make a difference in that but the only reason why i was kind of being you know a little bit of trepidation with saying you know this is the birth of modern warfare is and rightfully so sometimes us canadians get some criticism for saying you know we're the first to do this first to do that we're amazing we're this we're that I say this and I've said it before, we have a bit of a chip on our shoulder when it comes to these kinds of things. So I try to reel that back a little bit being like, yes, we are good, but sometimes we're not. So I just like to sometimes throw those reminders in. Yeah, they're there, yeah. but it's not even just a Canadian only operation. I mean, the entire war is never for the Canadian no. Corps or the CEF is never just Canadians. That's a huge myth that I do my best to bust. It's difficult, but this is one of them. And that's something I think it's worth talking about. Mm, mm. I mean, I, I asked Lance Cattermole about this, and, and he, you know, he was British born. He'd gone to Canada before the war. Right. And, and what he said was, he said, we, he said, although I was young, he said, and you know, I, I couldn't really call myself Canadian because mm. I'd only been there a few years. We felt different because we had ventured across the Atlantic to a strange land to find our fame and fortune. And, and as a consequence of that, we felt we were slightly apart from the ones mm. that hadn't, the ones that had stayed behind right. to work on the land or work in the factories or work in the mills or work in the mines. Um, and I think it was, it was that's where the chip begins. And, and you can see why, you know, if you, if you got, I mean, he went gold panning. That was, that's what they went there to do, to make yeah. their fortune, because there were all these popular novels telling them they were going to find golden yeah. nuggets as big as their head. And, of course, that was not, <laughs> not true. Which never uh, yeah. So you can see where it comes from. And I, and I think, uh, yep. uh, you know, I don't subscribe to the, the, the view that the, the Germans were afraid of Canadians, but no. not at this stage of the war. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think that these were troops that gave a good account of them. And the symbolism of this battle 
um, with the attack of these Canadian troops on a French village where the objective was to capture that French village shouldn't be underestimated because this was the first time in the 20th century that Canadians liberated a part of France. And, and you know, we know the significance of that with Benny Sumer and Courseul in Normandy. Mm -hmm. This is just as significant a generation before. And although the bulk of the troops that made the attack were English-speaking Canadians, when it came to the liberation of the village and the clearing of the village and going back to those cellars, clearing the cellars, it was the Vandus, the 22nd Canadian Infantry, the French Canadians, who were detailed to do that. And again, I do not think that that is any kind of coincidence um, that it was done deliberately because it was yeah. a statement. I mean, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I was doing some brushing up last night and this morning, and it's it's interesting. And and I agree with you about Nicholson. It's it's great, but for that part, he doesn't really talk about that. And uh, 1960s Canada has got a bit of stuff going on. So anyway, that's a bit of an aside, but with the French English relations, but it's it, it is interesting that it's. I think I, I I think I completely agree with you here. It's it's just like oh yeah, they just threw the fifth brigade in line, and I'm like. They just picked one at random. That doesn't seem right, you know. Like I get that there's all these mitigating factors and everything that can come up, but it, it, I think you might be right. Like this is, and there's other significance with the 22nd Battalion or the Van Dus, as they're still called today and still around. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of our permanent force regiments today. Uh, yeah, it's got the symbolicness to it. It was an important part of of the war. I mean, the government was trying to use it for its own ends, but it was an important part for a lot of people. And and, and I think you're right. It's just the symbolism cannot be ignored it's it, it's it's yeah i think you're right it's too much of a coincidence to be just nothing yeah no no definitely so the the attack generally went well i mean this was it was favorable conditions um mm -hmm. on the 15th of september generally in the battle of what became known as fleurs corselet the majority of british units that attacked that day took the majority of their objectives the canadians took the majority of theirs um, there were casualties, but no, nothing on the scale of the 1st of July. Mm -hmm. Most of these units that took part in this initial attack continued to fight for the course of the next seven to ten days. But after that, of course, they were wound ground down by the fight and withdrawn and, and needed reinforcements. But mm -hmm. this wasn't any kind of First World War slaughter, this battle. It was very successful. The barrage worked, the tanks assisted them, the positions were taken. There was some stiff fighting. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the 15th September, they'd captured the village. They'd dug in in the valley beyond it. They'd captured the sunken lane to the east that came down to the albert Bapone Road. They'd met up with men from the 15th Scottish Division on their right. Um, the only area where there'd been little success was on the left at Mouquet Farm when the Canadian men of rifles had made their attack there. And that position was so formidable mm -hmm. and so confused and confusing then I'm not surprised. It would take another month and a bit before that was properly cleared. Um, yeah. And men of, you know, just about umpteen nations involved in the battle there. So, um, yeah. the sorry, the descriptions of the, of the lines are just, yeah, it's like a maze. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. So yeah. 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 And, and the Germans had tunnels and they had bunkers and, and everything. So, I mean, the story of Mouquet Farm is a separate story in many respects, but, it is. Yeah. But, but generally this was a successful day. Uh, and they dug in, the line had moved forward, um, uh, and they'd captured the, f the forward German positions. Beyond that was a system of, of linked German trenches, Zollen Graben, linking up towards what was called Zollen Redoubt, towards Thiepval, and then above that, a long German trench, which is often described as the longest German trench on the Western Front, although there's probably a few other contenders for that, even on the Somme with a switch trench, for example. But mm -hmm. um, it ran from west of Thiepval across to um, Le Sar, the next, uh, the next village. Um, and when we look at a dead flat map like this, even though it's got you know, colour contours on it, yeah. <coughs> it's difficult to really appreciate how well sighted that trench was. But it mm -hmm. was. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to put this one in as well, actually, because um, it's not a brilliant map and probably not doing it justice to it in this format. But th there was a, a series of books published during the war called Canada in Flanders. 
<laughs> and volume one covers second E, volume two covers um, Givinci and the uh, Canadian Orchard and um, and on into the Battle of the St. Lawrence Craters. And then the rarer volume three covers course select. Now, these were published during the war. They're not 100% accurate, but they're very interesting in terms of the historiography of it in, in, in that they give you what was the contemporary view of Canada's part in this. And they right. do contain some really good maps, which mm -hmm. considering this was published during the war, it's, it's unusual. They gave away this amount of detail yeah, um, because it names trenches on there and it shows individual battalions. I mean, the battle was over when this was published, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. the fight and returned here in 1918. So it, it's quite a significant little book. Um, if you ever see a copy of it, buy it because it was, it never sold and they're very rare. And the copy yeah. that I've got, was given to me by Lance Catamol, the veteran who fought there. So it's a, a particularly treasured little possession. So. I've never seen a physical copy. I'm sure there's a digital one somewhere, but uh, there, there is. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. off the top of my head, but I know there is. Yeah. So yeah, so I just wanted to throw that one in there. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting map. Yeah, it's very surprising. But, I mean, maybe that was part of what's our Lord Breaver books. Yeah. Plan. I mean, he was a newspaper salesman. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we have a reason why, you know, sells, sells the book. So, and I just wanted to, I'm not going to, again, go through the history of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, but the men yeah. that came to fight at Corselet were part of that rich story of the CEF, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, which starts with the, with the, the formation of it in 1914 from units of what were the Canadian militia before the war that became these numbered battalions and all the support units that went with it. Um, and like I said, I'd, for many, many years, I mean, I've, I've got a big collection of original images of the Great War, which I've mm -hmm. collected over nearly four decades now. Um, and you used to see these sort of pictures all the time. And th this is a postcard that I've got of men of the 2nd Battalion right at the beginning of their sort of service, having arrived on Salisbury Plain, and this is November 1914, and, and this is mm. typical of the, the original Canadian Expeditionary Force that came over, part of that first Canadian division, um, and in, in units like this. And again, another great source that you've got in Canada is the, the battalion nominal rolls. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I used to do research on Canadian battalions, the Imperial War Museum in London has got a full set of these. So you could go through them and you could pull out all sorts of fascinating data and work out the sort of background makeup of battalions you know where did men mm -hmm. come from and units like this they could easily be 70 plus percent uh, men born in great britain um so they were yeah. yeah but th but then you'd see also listed you know men born in in belgium and and the netherlands and and even i mean i came across germans and russians mm -hmm. um and it lists their previous um um military service military so you've got service, many yeah. served in the yeah imperial russian army italian army yeah. french army i mean i've seen i've seen ottoman citizens ottoman ottoman empire uh yeah well there we are i mean that's which, it's amazing uh, in syria i found one yeah well because also sorry just not cut off paul again but it, it there's these are all available online now the service records through Library right. Archives Canada. it's an amazing source i use it what several times a week uh, and it's, it's it's great if you ever have questions or it's even fun to just poke around and find out all these stories that's how i find mm. all these crazy details but yeah sorry Paul. yeah ahead. well i was gonna say i think it shows how cosmopolitan this army is probably you know possibly the austro-hungarian army was the only equivalent yeah. on the other side um yeah, but in terms right. of you know western allied nations ca the canadian expeditionary force represented such a huge swathe of different people that it makes it completely unique in that respect, far more than any other then empire nation, now Commonwealth, of course. But uh, mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what, to me, it's one of the things that's always made it fascinating because these men had come from the four corners of the world to Canada to, to, to make their life. And, and, and like Lance Catamol, perhaps only been there for a short time, but felt yeah. enough of a connection to Canada to enlist and fight for it. Yeah. Or some were just looking for something different to do. <laughs> well, that as well, yeah. They're not, they're not found over. those gold nuggets. <laughs> yeah, they didn't find enough. They got homesick. No. Uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, the stories are, are amazing. And one of the reasons why I like studying the First World War is just all these stories are, are fascinating. And they're available. Yeah. So the, the Canadian Expeditionary Force expands, and this is another, this is from a little collection I've got of, um, I think it's the 35th Battalion, something like that. Um, so this is 1915, 
um, taken in Canada. Um, they've got uh, core blimey hats, some of them, which was a, a British bit of kit made for the winter of 1914-15. Um, but, you know, Canadian insignia, Canadian battalion cap badges now rather than the general Canadian service cap yep. badge that meant a lot of men in the first division initially war. And as the as the the army expands, the number of battalions expands. And what was it, two hundred and sixty odd different battalions by the end of the yeah. war? So yeah. um, staggering number. Uh, and it begins, I think, you know, gradually as they expand the recruitment to um, reflect more and more of the diversity of, of Canada uh, through the creation of these different battalions. Yeah, two things that, because I looked at this photo before, it's very interesting. Two things, well, one I just noticed is there's somebody back here. Think, oh, no, that's a shoulder, but there's also so many <laughs> short guys. It's crazy. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> it's the gazebo, because then this is clearly in a Canadian park, mm. which is a story that you just read all kinds of places. Like, that's where they form up and take photos like this, and usually more about the marching and that. I've seen so many of those from every tiny little town, mostly yeah. in, in Ontario, where I'm from. They're everywhere. Uh, but anyway, it's just so funny to to see some of these places that you know yeah. where you're from there, yeah. and they've been around this long, and you get these kind of visions of them. I think people are really um, – that speaks to a lot of people, like it does to me when I was younger. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. This is a great photo. <laughs> I haven't seen many like this. No, I mean, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're great, those sort of images. They, they tell you so much about the men, I think, if nothing else. Yeah, definitely. So this one is uh, you know, on arrival in, in, uh, in Britain. You know, Salisbury Plain became Canada's first sort of base camp in Britain. Eventually, they'd take over at Seaford and, and also Folkestone as the war moved on. Yeah. And um, I was I was down in Wiltshire uh, last week, actually, uh, going across Salisbury Plain. And this, this is an image um, that shows them digging into the, the chalk of the Wiltshire Downs, which, which, of course, would have, you know, resonance for the men that went on to fight in places like um, Corsolette and, of course, Vimy, where you see these you know, dramatic wartime photographs showing mm. um, the soldiers in chalk landscapes. And, and for these guys, that was part of the very beginning of their war experience before they even got to uh, to the Western Front, which is interesting in, in many ways. Yeah, it's just so funny. Yeah, the chalk comes up again in memoirs. But even if you go there, you can see it. Literally, you can see it. If you go to the tunnels at Vimy, it's chalk. It's just yeah. such a almost ubiquitous part of Canada's war. Yeah. And then, you know, more and more battalions are formed. This is the 54th Battalion, the Kootenays. And that's mm -hmm. Lieutenant Colonel Kemble in the middle there who commanded them. He, he led them into the attack at Corselet um, and in the fighting around Regina Trench. And he was killed um, in that two battalion attack on Vimy in March 1917, before the main battle, yeah. when they yeah. launched that gas attack and sent yeah, both battalions, them in the 75th, I think it was, yeah. um, over on, a, on, on these large scale raids. Uh, and again, you know, you, you can see. There was a standard Canadian tunic. Gradually, that became a British tunic as the war went on because they, it was expensive to produce these highly tailored Canadian. I mean, they're beautiful bits of kit, um, but they cost a lot of money. A and lot the, of as money. the war went on, yeah, uh, and difficult um, and, to do separately. It's, it's yeah, yeah, um, and and again, it you know it gives you a good cross section of the army. I mean, some a couple of tall officers there, particularly that one on the right, um, and then yeah. A few few lads more like me, short asses who uh, are standing there in the ranks. So um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I kind of get lost in images like this because you know this is you're looking into the faces of the men who fought the Great War and you're seeing the diversity in different types of guys that were there. And I think it's great, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm more on this guy's uh, uh, side here, the taller side. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, again, I love these photos and the different kits. And again, like you said, you can tell something from these just the way they some men stood it's 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 interesting that the personality comes through a little bit in these and it's great to see over 100 years later yeah for sure and then th this is this is one of my favorite canadian postcards i've got this is taken in france before uh, or around the time of the final course alert um, possibly at arras because there is a, a studio at arras that right. uh, has a leafy sort of background like this um, and that's the Regimental Sergeant Major Collet of the 20th Battalion with the Bandmaster and the Regimental Quartermaster Sergeant. So you've got the Quarter Bloke, the Sergeant Major, 
um, and the bandmaster. And um, and these guys are you know tough, experienced soldiers. Uh, Colic got the MC for the action at Corsola. He was the RSM that led the uh, the battalion into action. All three of them survived the war. I mean, you know, we look at these pictures and very often people say on Twitter, oh, I wonder if they all died. And not mm. everyone died. Not everyone <laughs> most, died. <yeah>. most <laughs> men came back. But um, if you go to the next one, I think this, again, this is the power of these images when you look into the, the faces of a, of a photograph um, like that. And, uh, you know, these are three men that, that fought at Corsolet. And I think that's, again, for me, the, the, the power, part of the power of these types of images. Yeah, and, and and the mustaches are, are yeah. on point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish I could pull something like that off. Uh, I <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just it's great to see this. And then again, you can see the the divisional uh, insignia, which is yeah another part of Canada's war. That's uh, yeah, funny. absolutely. Yeah. So we we move on to uh, you know we've seen the faces of men that fought, of course, on it. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is these again using some aerial images to see what the landscape was like. So, this is a photograph showing Sugar Trench, which we saw on the map before. And um, Poziers is down the bottom left hand corner. So the Canadians attack from the bottom left to the top right corner of this of this picture, and that's the road that leads into uh, into Corselet. Um And it gives you an idea of what the landscape looked like. Again, this is just before the assault. So it shows, I mean, there would have been a few more shell holes there on the 15th of September, mm. but it wasn't quite as yet the moonscape. Um, it was damaged by shell fire. The trenches were damaged by shell fire, but it wasn't this kind of moonscape that we tend to think of when we think of First World War battlefields. I mean, that would come at Corselet, but, but not at this particular stage. And it shows as well how intricate and connected the German defence lines were here that this wasn't just some kind of quick throw up of a position that this was formidable right. german defenses that they were going into yeah that that part is the one that that speaks to me the most because like you mentioned already and we'll get there but it's the the taking of course a lad is not the typical as you envision first world war battle of slaughter and failure etc i mean that's coming uh, it is technically an end of victory i suppose if you if you want to call it that but you do see that, and I, that is because the German positions are so strong. I mean, you can go back to that map we already showed or any of the ones in the official history. Again, if you download it, you can find them really quick because it's all indexed mm. and easy to use. It's just, it's kind of mind-boggling. Um, mm, definitely, yeah. Things are, really are, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Germans, their policy was, we're here to stay. And when you look at images like this, you can see how they express that on the landscape. Yeah, it's 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 it, well, it's even well, we'll get to there, but even on the ground, it's sometimes hard to envision <laughs> what that would have looked like. So th this is this is kind of the next bit, really. So we're kind of following the route of the Canadian attack into Corselet from the air um, through Sugar Trench into the continuation of that road into the edge of the village. So this is the western side of the of the village, um, and it shows. You know, the village had trenches around it. It shows where we see tracks on there, the movement of men and guns probably pulling back uh, prior to the, the Australian fighting and things like that. Um, and again, it shows the condition of the village as it was at that time. And, mm -hmm. and one of the big problems that they, that they had, as we mentioned, was the clearing of the cellars, which every building had. Um, and you get the impression when you read the accounts of the Canadian battalions that were here, that they were out to prove what they were capable of doing and, and that they were, I would just say, probably quite businesslike in the way that they conducted this fight and they were professional in it and they mm -hmm. wanted to do it properly and they wanted to do it effectively. And, and they didn't squirm about what kind of weapons that they used to do that. So there were no flamethrowers used here, but the troops were issued with P-bombs, which are phosphorus hand grenades, and uh, these were then used to clear the cellars. And this was, again, a throwback to the 1st of July when there'd not been enough mopping up as units had gone forward and they'd not cleared dugouts. So waves had gone forward towards the next line of German trenches. The dugouts were still full of Germans behind them. They popped up, fired into the rear of these lines and, um, yeah, disaster had ensued. So in, in this attack, and, and not just this attack, but other attacks the troops are issued with these phosphorus grenades 
and uh, and they were used to clear the dugouts because once phosphorus goes off in a confined space, no one's going to come out of that. And and this is one of the darker sides of the First World War. We don't like to talk about this mm -hmm. sort of thing, but it you know their job was to kill Germans, yep. um, and and that's what they went in there to do. They weren't there to go and shake hands with them and hug them in no man's land. They were there to evict this invader from a ground over which it had no dominion. And mm -hmm. uh, um, and like their counterparts in the British Army, they were going to use every and any weapon to do that. And the Germans had set that precedence with the introduction of poison gas and right. flamethrowers and so on. So yeah. it I was, was going to say, some of the men that survived, you know, second heat <laughs> were there like, when yeah. these supposed rules were broken. So, I mean, I'm yeah. sure there was, well, I know there, it gets worse. But yeah. There was no love lost uh, from the yeah. Canadian perspective, the Germans. I know, definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely. So that, that gives a bit of an idea of that. Yeah, it's a stunning photo. I mean, the aerial photos are amazing. So that, that then sees the Canadians capture the village in one day. Very successful attack. Um, I've never seen a reliable casualty figure for that one day, but um, no, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a few thousand rather than, you know, the thousands of the 1st of July. Yeah. But there was a lot of men involved, you know, two, two entire divisions one way or another. Um, and when you read the accounts after action reports, considered acceptable losses for what they were able to uh, to achieve which is, is quite a leap forward i mean you know it's it's a mile and a half or more mm. from the start line to the other side of course select village so that kind of advance in a first world war battlefield is, is not to, not to be sniffed at really <laughs> no it's not uh, um but the challenge was what lay ahead uh, yes. really the village was the easy part the yeah. the real mincing machine as the french called verdun of, of the somme from a canadian perspective was regina trench mm -hmm. um because it was sighted on the reverse slope of the next bit of high ground had been dug when it, no one could challenge the germans to dig it so it was the best possible positions and from the village you could not see it so it could only be seen from the air and this caused a lot of problems. So 1st of October was the first attack. 26th of September, they'd pushed to the east of Corselet towards the area that what was called the North and South Practice Trenches, which were, again, some of these practice trenches the yep. Germans had, had dug. And that established a sort of a salient around Corselet. And using that salient, they then began to move towards Regina Trench um, from roughly sort of south-north and southeast to sort of northeast. And the first attack was really poorly planned in many respects because mm. no, they couldn't see the, the German positions. The, the artillery were firing to a degree blind. Oh, it did little damage to the German positions were there. The Germans had sally ports that came forward of the trench that gave them observation over the ground that approached them. And it, it is massive open fields. So when these guys attacked from shallow trenches dug around Corsolet up towards Regina Trench, it would have looked very similar to that sequence in the film 1917. Mm, right. Because it was those kind of trenches they were attacking from over that kind of landscape towards entrenched Germans and the machine guns, the German trench mortars um, and their artillery that were tucked away in a position which we call Boom Ravine um, which was a valley that led to the nearest village of Grandcourt, just caused merry hell, and those 1st of October attacks just melted away yeah. under that fire with absolutely yeah. no no success. And I, I think I think there was close on 1,500, 2,000 casualties in, in that attack alone. And yeah, 105, yeah. yeah, and 105 so. years ago today, on the 8th of October, yeah. It was pretty much the the repeat of that. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they got a bit closer every time they did it, yeah. um, but they still hadn't really affected any proper entry. And, and the, the old unit that gets in quickly gets repulsed and thrown out again. Just yeah, and that's the post I did for today because for my daily uh, Twitter account and other platforms is this attack. And again, you can find the map 
in the official history, which I use, or just go to my, my Twitter account. The link, link is in the description for that. You can see it's, it's the attack goes up and then they come back and then they go up and then they come back. It's yeah. all of it. Yeah. There's individual, like again, as Nicholson writes, it's, there's individual successes, but even if they are successful, they can't hold it. They can't even come uh, close to holding it. As we know, the Germans doctrine is counterattack, take it back. And yeah. they do that quite effectively on the 8th. Absolutely. And, and the, the, the other advantage that the Germans have with Regina Trench is that they have these approaches from the neighboring villages that they can bring up reinforcements pretty much unseen by the Canadians. So it means that every attack that goes in, even if the defending garrison suffers losses, they can quickly replace those men or reinforce them with fresh troops coming up from behind. Um, and the Canadians can only do that by bringing men over open ground. So it, it causes the losses, you know, I, I would guess that in both of those attacks combined, there were more casualties than in the first 10 days at Corsolet. Yeah. You yeah. know, easily, easily. Yeah. So um, it, it wasn't a good time. And, and then what happened between that 8th of October attack and the more successful attack on uh, Regina Trench on the 21st of October was that essentially they inched their way towards it in different places. And there were small-scale battles with a company of men, a few platoons of men, um, capturing a trench, taking a bay, knocking out a German strip of wire and things like that. And yeah. gradually that put them in a position where the gunner officers could see the trench, directly artillery fire, um, and the assault was far more successful. So on the 21st of October, with the British attacking on their left, the, the 18th Eastern Division, which was one of the best divisions in the in the British Army in 1916, um, it saw a big leap forward and Regina Trench was penetrated in quite a few different places. Not entirely taken, right. but the bulk of it was in Canadian hands and that would continue until the 10th of night, the 10th, 11th November. So it was creeping towards the end of the Battle of the Somme and Regina Trench was then pretty much in Canadian hands. But the battle was not <laughs> was not over uh, because beyond yeah. Regina Trench was a valley and on the other yeah. side of that valley was the next trench, which was Desire Trench, and that was the final action on the Somme on the 18th of November as um, 4th Division, 4th Canadian Division men went in and uh, in a snow blizzard, mm -hmm. um, you know, we tend to think the only time Canadians went over the top in the snow was at Vimy. Everything happened at Vimy. We know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, we think that, yeah. But, but you know, Corselet was, a, was another example of it. And it's possible that in one of these attacks, tanks came up and were used again because Victor Wheeler, who I mentioned, who wrote No Man's Land, which is a, an account I think it was published in the 70s or the 80s and has now been reprinted. Um, yeah. yeah, he was a 50th Battalion signaller. And he talks about setting up his signal post in the wreck of a tank on the eastern side of Corselet. So that kind of indicates that somewhere or other, and I've never found you know, the actual evidence of this, but uh, there was some kind of tank involved in some action there. But unlike the first assault, they weren't used in any kind of numbers again in this area. That was right. saved for the end of the Battle of the Somme in around Thietvale mainly in the Yonkra. Yeah, there's hardly any given to the, well, given to support the Canadian Corps towards yeah. the end. And there's dwindling numbers available generally because of all the problems yeah. we talked about before. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, yeah, this map is a good one too because it highlights all the big progressions of the battle. Mm. And yeah, the one thing that stuck out to me, having read again and seen some more diaries is, yeah, like you said, these little incremental advances, blocking a trench to hold a chunk and then just keep pushing forward. It's, 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 it's remarkable to read and what it took to get to this yeah point. yeah absolutely and, and this again using the air photos this is at the junction of Kenora trench and regina trench um yeah. fairly early on in the battle and we can see our artillery's kind of dropped blind around it yeah. um and the the landscape's damaged by it but um the, uh, the actual trench itself is still pretty formidable um and i mean on, on the original of this you can see germans actually in the trench it's so such high definition it's just incredible really yeah. you can see the the sun glinting off the top of their style helms because by, by again by this stage of the battle i think when the canadians first took course the much prized 
trophy of the pickle halber um was with i'm sure and well i know was captured by canadians but yeah. by october the germans were beginning to use the style helm in much greater numbers and and i think that's what we're seeing the sun reflecting off on images like this yeah and and the descriptions too of regina trench like you said is in some chunks completely untouched yeah wire untouched the, the trench yeah. itself untouched it's it, yeah. again they're shooting blind and yeah and you can see that here yeah, I mean, there's some pretty horrific accounts of guys getting to the wire and trying to cut their way through it with these little hand uh, barbed wire cutters, which, yeah. you know, I've, I've I've got pairs of those. I mean, I wouldn't cut my garden fence with them things, let alone the German wire in yeah. front of the Regina Trench. And guys getting, you know, almost crucified on the barbed wire by machine gun fire. So it was not a, a nice place to be no, uh, at all. And then this is moving up to the main section of Regina Trench. So this is north of that valley coming out of Corselet. And again, you can see the beginning of the damage and the strength of these of these trenches. And it's it's this kind of landscape that was turned into this moonscape as the battle mm -hmm. moved on. And by the 21st of October attack, it was just shell crater after shell crater after shell crater. And, and that's when uh, Captain Harry Scott of the 87th Battalion was killed. It was Canon Scott's son. And Canon Scott's the first division. He was in the, in the Royal Montreal Regiment, the 14th Battalion, and then moved up to um, up to Vimy actually by then. Yeah. And um, and then he got a notification that his son had been killed, and he managed to get a lift down to the brickworks outside Albert, where the 87th Battalion was at rest after the attack on Regina Trench, and they gave him a bit more detail. Um, and some of his men, his, his son's men, offered to go with him to try and recover the body. And he came up to this place, which is, I mean, we're talking like five or six miles hike across Smash Battlefield to get up mm -hmm. here. Um, and by a miracle, in this mess of shell holes, they found his body and recovered it and, and took it back to Albert for burial. And that's one of the interesting things that you see in these attacks is there's, as we'll discuss, a huge number of missing. Mm -hmm. There was a, a distinct... When you look at the number of officers that have graves, not at Corselet, not at Adenac, not at Regina Trench, although there are some there, but at Albert, um, they obviously made an effort to recover certain bodies because they knew if they left them up there, there'd be nothing, they'd be gone forever. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was sadly you know, the truth with so many of them. Yeah, unfortunately, true. <laughs> And then in terms of, I mean, I was, you know, um, you and Carla Jean have done so many great talks on Canadian photography of the Great War. I'm not going to try and even replicate that. But one of the <laughs> things that surprised me, you know, in the 90s, um, I mean, you, your archives in Canada are just great in contrast to the Imperial War Museum that wanted to basically make me remortgage my house to be able to use uh, some images. Uh, yeah. I wrote to the Canadian archives and said, what have you got on Corselet? And they sent me a, a photocopy of the, of the images that they had um, and the price, which was very, very cheap. Um, and I bought prints of them all. And they said, well, you, you know, you, there's no copyright restrictions on them. You just got to give accreditation, right. and blah, 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 and you can use them. Uh, but what I was surprised at compared to other battles, and maybe this is because this is the genesis of Canadian war photography, is there isn't actually a lot of photographs and, and what they show are quite odd subjects. I mean, you know, this is a, this is probably one of the better ones of a, some kind of support trench somewhere near Corselet with, a, with the men maybe under fire, although it's difficult to tell whether that's in the distance or not, but. Uh, yeah, it's not easy to tell. Yeah. Um, but a lot of them show trench railways and wounded coming back and yeah. German prisoners or, you know, GVs, general views of the village where you can see a bit of the ruined Red Chateau and things like that. Yeah. Nothing like the sort of photographs that you see taken later on. But but I guess these guys were like, you know, honing their crafts here. So it, it reflects the whole Canadian Expeditionary Force experience. Yeah, I think so. I was talking to, to Carla, yesterday, Carla Jean yesterday about something else we're planning on doing. And her, <laughs> we were just choking around. And she's like, yeah, for me, the Canadian War starts in 1916 because mm. that's when the official photographers come in. And mm. yeah, we've done lots of shows on that and talked about these kinds of things. But yeah, these photos are are, are great to see. But this yeah. one is, in particularly is different in a trench. Yeah, and again, one of the things we talked about is we can't know for sure what's actually going on. No. We can, 
no. just kind of guess or use the research like people like Carla Jean have done and, and yeah. try to understand. But again, no, it is a great photo to see just anything general conditions are yeah. very interesting to see. I, mean, I, I didn't dare use the photograph of the shell shock soldier, for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't use that one. Uh, I have that one too saved, but uh, yeah, yeah. Definitely not using that one ever again. <laughs> no, no, no. no. So, um, and then. As the fighting goes on, uh, it sees the award of several more Victoria Crosses. Yeah. We mentioned Leo Clark for the pre corselet fighting around Monster Alley and so on. Uh, he was then subsequently wounded in the fighting for, for Regina Trench and died of his wounds at, at La Havre and buried in the, uh, mm. in the cemetery there. Um, Chip Kerr, the 49th Battalion, um, in the attack on Zollengraben, uh, at the point of the bayonet, it took an incredible number of German prisoners and was awarded the Victoria Cross. He survived the war. And then Piper Richardson uh, of the Canadian Scottish um, um, in the attack on Regina Trench went forward, piped the men in action. Um, as the attack failed, they pulled back and he helped evacuate casualties and left his pipes behind and then, yeah. against orders, ran back to go and get them and was never seen again yeah. until his body was recovered after the war and he's buried in, in Adenac Cemetery. I mean, you know, he's become... I mean, when I first looked into this, I, I, I don't think that he was as well known as mm. he is now. I mean, there's, he's become, I would say, a Canadian legend now. And oh, yeah. right, rightly so, you know, because he was just a kid, really. Yeah, 20, um, 19, 20, yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, those stories were not popular, but I mean, and I've discussed this with many other people, I mean, the Scottish influence on the Canadian Army and Canada in general is yeah. it's huge. I mean, the well, what me think is, is interesting is, so it's a bit of an aside, but the, the tombstone back here says Scottish. Yeah. Probably a Canadian, actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's Quite likely, yeah. They were the, so we have so many, we still do have so many Highland regiments yeah. in the Canadian Army. Too. Well, I think we have more than Britain does, actually, <laughs> technically. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, but I just, yeah, he his story and, and the piping is so well known in Canada. I mean, we do piping for all kinds of things. I mean, we got piped into my high school graduation. So it's just, it's any story that has this kind of connection is, is yeah. very popular. And I mean, he is rightfully, he earned that Victoria Cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one, one of the things that I did when I lived at Corsolet is uh, when I looked into his story, I roughly worked out their line of advance because Canadian Scottish battalion history is a really good one. Um, yeah, a, a lot of detail in it. And, and I walked uh, one winter when there was no crops in the fields basically from their start line to where Regina Trench was. Mm. Uh, and although the landscape, there's no shell holes there, the German wire's gone and the trench is filled in, you still feel massively exposed on that landscape. And when you think back to when these guys went in, you can see that with, without their artillery doing its job, they didn't stand a chance. And, and in that, those early attacks, that's sadly what happened. Yeah, and it's. I, I agree. It, you, you feel exposed. <laughs> I don't know yeah. what else word to use. I mean, felt that in sumer, numerous places on the song. It's just mm. you feel exposed. It's just so wide open. It's it's yeah. hard to fathom. Uh, and then that that brings us up to you know the, the losses at uh, at uh, Corselet. Um, I mean, this is a row of Canadian soldiers killed on this day and 105 years ago in, in in 1916, buried in the original plot of Regina Trench Cemetery. Over 24,000 Canadian casualties, uh, of which over 8,000 were killed in action, of which over 6,000 were missing. You know, mm -hmm. one of the highest proportions, if not the highest proportion of missing of any Canadian battlefield, possibly of either World War. Um, I would guess in World War Two, possibly apart from Dieppe, um, mm -hmm. the proportion of missing you know, probably is nowhere near uh, oh. in World War Two whether it was in World War One, but uh, sure, yeah. uh, but this battle was just and, and it's because of what we've seen on these air photos. You know, there was failed attacks, bodies lying in no man's land, ground smashed to bits by shell fire from both sides. Uh, if you buried men, it was in shell craters. Mm -hmm. The ground got chewed up again. You know, and, and there was another two years of war ahead, mm -hmm. um, and the fight and returned there again twice in 1918. So such a high proportion, um, and and walking those battlefields in that decade or so that I lived there, you would find fragments of human remains everywhere. Yeah. Um, again, it was a, a reality of it, um, and the, the commission have flower beds in certain cemeteries which they use, consecrated flower beds which they bury these fragments of humans in, 
there's no way of telling whether they're Canadian, German, French, whatever. No. Um, but I think it's the yeah. right right thing to do because you, you can't just leave them there. You know, it's sort of... No, definitely not. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's the things that are left. On, on the song especially are... It almost got to be seen to believe even today. I mean, it's, it, yeah. it, it's crazy. Mind-boggling, I guess, is a better word. It is, <laughs> it is yeah, yeah. You know, the, the last page of its history is yet to be turned. Mm, oh, for sure. Um, so with with the war over, um, mm-hmm. it was two years of fighting ahead. I say fight and return in 1918, but Canadians went on to fight many other battles. And I think that the lessons that were learned in Corselet um, about how damaging and, and destructive attritional warfare could be if you continue to subscribe to that way of fighting, um, I think were then put into uh, into into practice and as we've said in, in in later battles and you know vimy was their next battle after this and mm-hmm. i'd like to think that some of the success that they had there was down to the, the sacrifice paid by so many men um at course in 1916 because that was the i guess the basis on which they made their future decisions at that particular point and yeah yeah, yeah, completely agree. I mean, yeah, it does come through if you get into the nitty gritty, a little bit of the details, and the, well, especially the planning of Vimy, which goes on for months, <laughs> mm. is definitely seen. The influence is there. Yeah, and this is this is the village as it was at the end of the war, um, completely destroyed. Every single house destroyed. People came back, but only a small number of them. They lived in. You can see there's a Nissan hut on there, um, provisional housing. There still is two provisional houses left in the village oh, wow. people, yeah people didn't want to give them up once they were given them they didn't want to give them back um so they kept them and there's wow. still a couple of them in the village they're getting rarer and rarer to find on the western front battlefield yeah there's i'm surprised a few. and then gradually it was uh, it was rebuilt and this is a little series of pictures i picked up some years ago taken by a canadian veteran who came back and photographed some of the places that he fought so this is the red chateau that we mentioned the ruins of it with the entrance to the cellars you can see and some guys still standing there and that, that was the canadian army medical corps field ambulances and canon scott the chaplain and all the others that sort of used that mm-hmm. that's what it was like the chateau was never rebuilt monsieur proyar who owned this chateau and another in a, a nearby village of combles both of them were destroyed he just took the compensation and never rebuilt mm. them um but the the cellars are still there and you know a couple of times over the years with with tv production we've tried to, to uh instigate a bit of archaeology there but it's kind of never happened yet maybe it will do one day who knows mm. i might leave that to your generation <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see what we can do <laughs> yeah and then there's that's what was left of the sugar refinery just you know amazing that any bits of it were still standing really but lots of bits of iron work and and so on um one of the guys dominic zanady who owns the tommy bar at posiers dug up a big sheet of metal between posiers and corselet recently which i'm sure is like something to do with this sugar factory um oh, yeah for sure yeah it's just these are again yeah I, the, what also sticks out to me is, is the sugar refinery because of sugar trench and the naming and everything it's just it's one of those things that Corselet and Sugar Trench and Sugar Refinery go, you know, hand in hand in my mind. Yep. And that's, that's another similar view that he, he took of uh, the same bits of ruin, you know. And yeah. uh, I mean, you see those cylindrical things, which are part of the burners for the, uh, uh, the yeah. brûleur, as the French call it, for the, for the, um, the sugar beet. Um, you see that in some of the contemporary artwork, you know, illustrated as, uh canadians fine of course so it's always like these cylindrical steel cylindrical things and i'm sure some people must have wondered what the hell they were but oh yeah, <laughs> <for sure>. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you'd be very confused and then this this to me is a very evocative photograph looking down the sunken road and, and Crichton's dugout i mean that's on the uh, uh eastern side of course which was the final objective reached on the night the 15th september and uh and they dug in there. I mean, that is a con- considering the type of camera that was taken with. I, I think that is a spectacular oh, it's an photograph. It's yeah, an amazing shot. Uh, that'd be yeah. an amazing shot today. It's it's amazing. So moving on a bit to the eighties, um, this is a series of photographs taken by John Giles, 
uh, who was the founder of the Western Front Association. He flew over the battlefield right. in 1983, right. and, and he took this series of pictures. And this is on the uh, eastern side, of course, of that, looking across the village, showing essentially it, how it was rebuilt. And uh, really, if you look at uh, those pre-war or well, those uh, those wartime aerial shots, when you know you could see buildings, there's very little difference in the makeup of the village. Um, at this time, when I when I first moved there, the village really had not changed since it was rebuilt since the 1920s. There's been a lot of modern building since, mm-hmm. but um, but it, had, it was a sleepy backwater village, and you know this uh, incongruous little French corner of France was one of those great killing grounds of Canada in in, in 1916. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's giving me uh, a little bit of the Verrier Ridge kind of vibe. Small, yeah. Yeah, farmland. <laughs> There's a lot of yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the next one is is a similar view looking back across the village, you know, showing how these places were rebuilt. We see it now; we kind of take it for granted. But some of these people lived for several years um, in uh, in primitive conditions before these buildings were were rebuilt. Right. I mean, the house that I lived in, um, there was nothing on the title deeds to say when it had been rebuilt, but. Um, when I did some work up in the uh, the loft, the grenier, that we found the um, the delivery dates of the timbers for the roof timbers, and that was uh, <laughs> June nineteen twenty three. So yeah, yeah. Um, so that's nearly five years these guys were were living until their houses were rebuilt. It's staggering, really. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. I mean, the, the most famous ones I've seen are, are the ones in Ypres, right? Even the town square when they're mm. like in ramshackle for literally months. Same with Passchendaele. It's just, it's the same. They did the best they could because what else can you do? Uh, exactly. Yeah, these exactly. Are, these photos are fantastic. And then uh, I'm, I'm lucky that I have uh, John Giles' album that he took in 83. When he died, his wife very kindly gave it to me. And because this is like 40, nearly 40 years ago now, so these battlefields, all of them have changed. And mm. these pictures have become part of the historical record in their own right in, in some yeah. respects. So, so this is the open ground north of the village, and that's Regina Trench Cemetery standing out. And you can see again, you know, how open these fields are. And, and, and even in this image, because the angle is taken, you can see rising ground up to the cemetery and then that valley beyond. Um, and that became the contested ground. The Regina Trench ran from left to right through one corner of that cemetery. Um, Desire Trench was the other side of the valley. And you've got to imagine this, you know, as, as that moonscape with no discernible features and the weather just getting worse and worse and worse as October moved into November. It's just unimaginable. Yeah. We just actually had a good question. Um, was this a bit of an aside, but was the, I don't, I don't think so, but was the village the site of any fighting during the second world war? No, the, uh, interestingly, the, the British army were actually in course elect during the phony war. There was a, a Royal electrical mechanical engineers, um, oh. unit um, based there and then they fled and the Germans then occupied the village in about 1943-44 um, an aircraft which I believe to be a Halifax came out of the sky and crashed in the valley at the back of where I used to live um, oh. and the mayor went down and uh, cut the insignia off the side of the aircraft and in the middle of the roundel was a maple leaf. It was a Royal Canadian Air Force right. squadron bomber. Um, the crew had bailed out and the aircraft just crashed. And the Germans then arrived, surrounded it, and did whatever they did with it. Um, so there was that, that kind of nice little nod to Canada yeah. in the Great <laughs> War when this Canadian aircraft crashed there in, in World War II. And then in 1944, the Germans, after the breakout at Falaise, um, yeah. They pulled back to the Somme. They thought they were going to fire on the Somme. They didn't. And the 9th SS Panzer Division came down through here, retreating um, towards Combray, and then went off for a rest in a little place called Arnhem. So and there, there was another oh, yeah. story. Um, <laughs> so, uh, no, there was no no serious fighting in the Second World yeah. War in, in, yeah, in this area. There were in some parts in the Somme, but not here. Yeah, just not this part because right? of the development of the fight. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Lorelei. So bringing it up to date, this is a uh, we can we'll skip through these ones because I'm, I'm mindful of the fact I've been gabbing on for an hour and a half now. So uh, uh, so this is a little journey around Corselet. So this is coming out where I used to live, the front door of my house. This is the view that I would have had 
coming to the wow. edge of the village, looking back towards Pozieres. So that's the kind of view that the, a German soldier would have had on the 15th September with the Canadians coming directly out and the 25th Battalion came straight towards these positions. And the, the radio mast you can see in the distance there is on the highest point of the Somme near the Pozieres windmill, which is roughly the start line of yeah. the Canadians in the attack and also where the tanks formed up to make their assault and it's where the tank corps memorial uh, is today and then uh yeah we're getting, coming to my somscapes now so this this is walking down the road uh, that view we just had is to our left it's not the same day uh, the weather doesn't change that quickly on the song but uh <laughs> uh this is a late summer evening and it's been a bit of rainfall and there's the sign for course select british cemetery and it's a you know massive open landscape and with it these big big skies and, and that's you know from a photography point of view is what makes it such a wonderful place to to take your camera to yeah it's a, it's a great well, i wish i had better weather <laughs> when i was there yeah I wish. um so you get you know amazing sunsets like this and corselet cemetery sits on a slight rise with a track leading up to it um and you get for a big chunk of the year the sun setting in different directions behind it Mm -hmm. So you can get these amazing, you know, sunsets and you don't have to do anything to them. You know, that's just camera on a tripod with a slightly different F-stop and a you know, different yeah. shutter speed and, and you get what you see in front of you, which is yeah. skies like that. And it's just incredible, really. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's one of the things that I miss. Uh, and, and this is it during the winter. You walk out and the Somme is, you know, as you discovered, you weren't there even in the winter. But... Uh, <laughs> It's an unforgiving place, and, and that yeah. tree is, is an interesting location because it's the village bomb dump. Um, <laughs> there's, right, right. There's, there's a big wooden potato crate under there, and that's where the farmers bring yeah. unexploded ordnance, grenades and shells, and yeah. even phosphorus bombs that they've found uh, have ended up in there as well. So uh, yes. don't go poking around in the wooden yeah, crate, basically. No, don't touch it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like... No. I still can't believe that has to be said, but don't touch it. Don't touch no, any of it. No. I mean, yeah, but again, the, these. I want to stop here real quick, but the mud, I know it's nothing like the war conditions, but the mud is no joke. It no. is. It lives up to every story you've read. It, it, it does, ruined yeah. clothes of shoes of mine. Like, they were destroyed. Uh, yeah. And I was yeah. willing to sacrifice them for this, no problem. Yeah, it's glutinous, and that's kind of looking up from... Yeah. The, from I'm standing next to the shell, shell dump there, looking up towards... Corselet Cemetery. You can see how the, the little lane weaves up to it, and the yeah. cemetery sits on a slight rise like that. And it's in that respect, it is a unique Somme cemetery, the way it's positioned, and mm -hmm. the fact that the, there's nothing of the modern world around it at all. No. And uh, and I think that's part of its uniqueness, really. So we get to you know, I mean, I, I do quite like a Corselet sunset. Somebody asked me recently if I if I uh, if I had the copyright to Corselet sunsets, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. What, what's really nice is to see, you know, in normal years when people are traveling in the battlefields, they go there now too. And, and I've seen loads of people take pictures of it. And it's really nice to see that, you know, people connecting with a yeah. you know, part of what I'd call the forgotten song because it just doesn't get the kind of visitors that yeah. um, the new Fallon Park does, for example. You know, it doesn't get that level of uh, visitors. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And yeah, I was going to say your, uh, your sunset shots uh, next time I'm going. I'm taking a few. <laughs> You've definitely inspired me to definitely do that now. We're good. And that, that's a, that was a like a, a, an early spring one. This is a summer sunset over Corselet when the, yeah. you know, the diffused clouds and you, you're lucky it's not just a, a flat sky with uh, just blue or whatever, but you've mm -hmm. got a bit of cloud and the crops are high yeah. um, and they've begun the harvest um, and so on. And the yeah. tractors work all night and the fields – are alive again in a different kind of way and it's uh you know all part of the magic of these places i think yeah it's a very uh again to bring the, the canadian in here but this is very reminiscent of the area i grew up in cool. southwestern ontario looks yeah. almost identical to this except for the cross of sacrifice yeah you can see in the distance yeah and the gate here not too many of those uh but no. the corn and the recently cleared field is childhood memories for me yeah. for sure and then that, that's a late summer sunset where, you know, um, there's a bit more blue sky, a few spotty clouds, but, you know, you've got the sun coming out and it's yeah. just, you get those incredible, um, incre they're just incredible skies. Yeah. It's one of the things that I, that I greatly miss uh, 
more than anything is uh, is that. But um, yeah, amazing. It's amazing. This is my probably your favorite that you, you yeah. So, so online anyway. That was an, that, yeah. That was one October with this just incredible sky with two sets of clouds meeting above the cemetery and it had rained again. The rain's always good. It's still the crops are are left in the field like that because uh, yeah. they use it for the shooting season. Um, and they've got wild birds that, um, that they've um, bred in the fields that are using them to hide, and then they'll beat it, and then they'll shoot. And uh, so gunfire echoes <laughs> across these fields again in a slightly different kind of way. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that brings us up to uh, to winter, and, and there it is in the there it is in the snow, and yeah. Um, and again, a, a most interesting. I mean, the first first winter I spent, of course, on it, um, it was minus twenty five, which is the same as what it was on the psalm in the winter of nineteen sixteen seventeen. And uh, I, I lived mm -hmm. in a brick house, so I can't complain. It wasn't in a trench, and yeah. um, uh, but we didn't have central heating. We had a pot boiler stove and so on. But it was cold. I've never experienced cold like that um, before or or since. But it just gave you that tiny, tiny insight into into what it must have been like for these guys to try and live. Forget fighting, but just living in live, these kind yeah. of conditions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the yeah. weather there, as you know, is yeah. It's you got to just go to take this stuff in. I mean, it's it's yeah. hard to describe. I mean, the different weather conditions I had while I was there, and just on the Somme part of the tour was yeah. It's hard to say. It did change because that year was an anomaly, but it was. It's yeah. very, very different. Yeah. And then you get up to the cemetery and it's it's got this beautiful entrance way and shelter, double set of steps, um, uh, and the trees are really much a part of it. I mean, they're all the original trees that were planted mm. when the cemetery was first made in the 20s, and that's getting rarer and rarer. And I, and I must, one of the things that always makes me uh, kind of feel um, anxious <laughs> about going back to the song is has the commission cut the trees down um mm -hmm. because they, they have done that in a number of cemeteries and i understand why but yeah the, i understand yeah it's it is i mean yeah i know what you mean because i saw a few as well and well some of them were doing damage some had been damaged yeah it's just it is yeah it, it, it's not great but sometimes it is completely necessary uh, to have yeah. to take them down yeah but yeah that's another amazing shot i mean it's, it's beautiful and that day you see the double steps going up and um yeah and and a few years ago in fact more than a few years ago in the field alongside it they they plowed it up deep plowed it for the first time in years and a whole bunch of uh, metal strips from the original wooden crosses came up mm -hmm. and the tractors picked them up on their tires drove down this road and literally you could walk down that road for weeks and pick up these little fragmentary bits of cross and one of my mates tim was up there and he found a whole ball of them welded together uh, <laughs> and he's gradually unpicked them over the years and last year during covid he flattened a few of them out got the details of the guys who were on them and tweeted a few of them and a guy from canada got in touch with him because his great uncle's name was on there wow. and he said that's my great uncle's name and that was on his cross and tim sent it to him so it went back to the family in canada and that's yeah. sort of quite a nice little thing to do really yeah, that's, that's amazing. And that's yeah. a drone shot. You can't you can't use drones on the battlefields anymore unless you're a commercial drone operator. But before the rules changed, I took a few drone shots, and it gives you an idea of the size of it. When you look at it from that angle, the graves on the left are almost entirely Australian from Muke Farm, and the graves on the right are almost entirely Canadian, mm -hmm. uh, with a few original burials. Of British troops who were there during the winter of sixteen seventeen, the bulk of the Canadians came from the Red Chateau, where the cemetery was, right in the middle of the village, right. and they were moved in there. Um, so most of the men in there were killed between the fifteenth and the twenty sixth of September. There's there's none from October at all or November in there. They're all from that early phase uh, of the fight, and then about half the graves of Canadians, about um, uh, just over nineteen hundred. Graves, I think it is at Corselet. Um, mm -hmm. But of them, um, about two thirds are, are unidentified. So um, loads of unknown Canadians in here, loads of them. Mm -hmm. 
And then as you go up, follow the tracks up onto the rise above the ridge, you get to Re Regina Trench Cemetery. Um, this is one where all the trees have now been removed, so it's a lot more open now than it, than it was. Um, this is a cemetery uh, with uh, about 2,200 burials in it, of which the bulk are Canadian. So it's got one of those Canadian Veterans Affairs uh, Canada plaques on the gate yep. Yep. Uh, indicating that, that it's predominantly a Canadian, Canadian. Um, yep. burial ground. Mm -hmm. uh, you go in um, and the original plots are at the back where the headstones are all touching and, and their men killed in the October battles, buried in what is part of or one of the sally ports of, uh, of Regina Trench. So it's, it is very much, you know, we, we, we know of the Devonshire Cemetery on the Somme where the Devons are buried in a trench. But Canada's got his kind of its own version of that here at Regina Trench, and I think that makes this quite an important cemetery in that respect. Oh, for sure. And then Adenac Cemetery again. This is taken before they took down the trees there, mm -hmm. so all those trees are now gone. Um, and uh, last year they had a, a big problem where somebody came down the road blind drunk, jumped the road, and went straight in the cemetery and took out the front row of headstones. Yep. Um, you know, the modern world goes on around these places, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. But it, it's testimony to the work of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission that yes. within a few, few days they were, they, you know, they pretty much replaced these stones and yeah. it was all done and dusted. So incredible. Yeah. And this is the one when, when we did our tour, the weather had broken. I mean, in the slightest way, <laughs> we spent a good chunk of time in Adnay. Mm -hmm. uh, be, and uh, yeah, well, I remember the story of the drunk driver, but it is, it's just flat. It's just yeah. nothing stopping them. But I mean, yeah. And I remember when I was there, there, this field had just been plowed ready for the planting. So there was shrapnel everywhere. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's, it's the iron, you know, the iron harvest goes on. Absolutely. But you know, th those three cemeteries together, um, there's a large number of Canadian graves in all three of those, but of the 8,000 Canadian dead, um, 6,000, more than 6,000 of them are commemorated here on the Vimy Memorial. And this is, again, you know, you know, I know you kind of touched on this in previous shows, but there is this obsession with Vimy, and, and, and not just with Canadians, I would say with British visitors as well. They go there and they see the names on that on the wall there. They think they're all Canadians killed at Vimy Ridge, and I've, I've heard British guides say that. With oh, okay. Um, but over 50% of the dead are killed at Corselet. So... You know, this is 6,000 missing. Um, just as I, you know, I encountered that myself with fragments of soldiers and, and that soldier's remains. He was, he was never identified. He was an unknown Canadian, reburied mm -hmm. at Corselet Cemetery. That that kind of, that part of the story of the Great War, Canada on the Somme, that will never end because the story yeah. of the missing um, will continue to be part of, of life on those battlefields. Yeah, it'll it'll go on well past <laughs> any of us here. Um, it's yeah. it's it's going to be a legacy that that lives on, and in the most, uh, it is as horrible, yeah. memory, but it is it's it, yeah. it's so striking and, and it just sticks with you. But yeah, and again, another great shot which I could not get. I'm so jealous. <laughs> People have had I had again. I, you could not see the memorial from the parking lot. That is how right. bad the weather was. I mean, I keep harping on this, but because I was just like, oh come on. But I just. I, that makes me just want to go. Well, I want to go back regardless, but that really makes me want to go back. But uh, yeah, yeah. It was another amazing shot. I mean, you know, it, it is the most magnificent one, of, certainly. I mean, yeah. people say one of the most magnificent. For me, it is the most magnificent memorial on the Western Front, on the British yeah. sector of the Western Front. Um, yeah. And, you know, I've been there in all weathers. I've been there at first light. I went there one, one morning when um, there were bats coming round the monument, mm. um, you yeah. know. Uh, it's just incredible. And, and I love, one of the things that I love is how these memorials and these cemeteries are part of the landscape and part of the nature of the landscape. And nature mm -hmm. is part of their story now. And I think that's a really important thing too because it's all interconnected really. Yeah, it is it's, it's uh, it is good to see. Um, I mean, yeah, well, Beaumont and Mel, same thing. Nature's yep. part of it now. Uh, same with Vimy. I mean, people love seeing the sheep. <laughs> Everyone mm -hmm. takes loves taking photos with the sheep that are usually around because um, that's what keeps the, the grass down. But again, yeah. yeah, you're right. This nature is part of it. And again, the vista on the other side. Oh yeah. What yeah. I've seen in photographs, not personally because you couldn't even see the tree line, but <laughs> is is amazing. Uh, and again, yeah. can't wait to go. And if you are ever even remotely close to Vimy, go. Yeah. 
I had a friend who has no, hardly any interest in any of this. He was going through France for something else. And I'm like, you have to go to Bimmy. You're going to be somewhat close. You have to go. And then he ended up taking his own little tour of Eep and everything. So that was great. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's how striking these things can be. And I mean, and again, we, we won't go on about this much longer, so we'll wrap up. But again, Vimy has that place. Corselet, not so much. And I think we both agree that it should. It's important. Uh, it, it, it needs to be understood because you can't understand what happens in 1917, particularly with the Canadian Corps, until you can understand what happened to Corselet. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I'm not the only one to say that. So, I mean, it's it, it's something important. And, and thanks for coming on to, to show the importance and to show all of this from photos, battle maps, to your own photos. This is, this has been amazing. My pleasure. So, so yeah, you have your own um, podcast, which I can, and Paul did not tell me to say this is amazing. <laughs> it's great. I listened to one yesterday. It was amazing about the, uh, uh, the epitaphs that were on the, the tombstones or that stone mm. from the war graves commission and the fascinating stories that come along with that. That's the latest one I listen to listen to them when I can. It's great. There is a link in the description below uh, to it. Uh, and there's also description, sorry, in the links in the description for numerous books that Paul has written about walking these battlefields, not just the Psalm, um, the Ras, uh, Eep. There's a D-Day one uh, and there's another one, all available. Uh, in some from, Can not as many from Canada, but the US and the UK, there's links uh, for those. So those are great. So, so yeah, this was great. Um, your knowledge to me is just breathtaking to hear you talk about this. I didn't want to stop you <laughs> and let you go. This is amazing to hear because you've lived there and you don't often get that um, from people. Yeah, people spend time there, but they don't live on the ground like you did. So it, it's it, it, it's fantastic. So um, did you enjoy the show? It wasn't too too uh, too much for you. Not at all. No, I mean you know this is this is what I do on a you know outside of COVID. This is what we do all the time on on battlefield tours and I could talk about this forever. You know, it's sort of, uh, it's part and parcel who I've been, uh, I've been as a, as a person for, for decades and decades now. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's great to hear your, your, your stories in this kind of form. Cause I don't know other way we can bring all these people together to do this. So it's, it, no. it's, it's amazing that we get no. to do this now. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for the opportunity to do it. And it's, you know, yeah. you're doing yeah, great no, work you. here, Brad. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That, that means a lot. So I'm just going to um, real quick uh, do a hand spiel and then I'll we'll come say bye to you. Cool. So thanks everyone again for watching uh, two back-to-back -back shows. Uh, thanks for coming out um, at a different time today. This was one of the best I think I've had. Uh, again, hearing all this, seeing all this is, is spectacularly amazing. So if you do enjoy this kind of stuff and you want to see more, uh, please support me in whatever ways you can. Uh, there's many ways you can do that from subscribing to the channel is a big one um, or hitting the like button. Leaving comments is a big part of this and that's how YouTube works and that's how this is going to reach more people so I can keep doing it. I do need help in other ways with some financial support is, is very important. Even the smallest amounts make a huge difference for me. So there's links to that below. You can become a patron. You get some benefits. Actually quite a lot and more and more all the time. So check that out and buy me a coffee. The links are all below. And if you're not on social media with me, I got stuff literally every day on there. So, so, so check that out and be sure to check out all the links I put for Paul as well. If you're not following him on Twitter, I don't know why you should be, <laughs> you're not, uh, you're, you're missing out on a ton. So, so, so please do that. Uh, and uh, again, subscribe to the channel, which is a big one I need because I'm pushing that 600 number. So if we can get there, that would be amazing. So, so thanks everybody for watching. Well, thank you. Thank so you for the opportunity. Time. And uh, yeah. So thanks we'll a lot. You, this was amazing. I hope to see you on the so, ground there one day. Uh, yes. Yeah, that would be hopefully soon. Hopefully this COVID business is on the last bits of it so we can go back to doing what we like to do. So anyway, sure. thanks again. Uh, thanks for everyone for watching. Uh, thanks for watching another video from On This Day in Canadian Military History. And I will see you next week. We've got some... Uh, some shell stuff starting. So keep, uh, keep a uh, watch out for that. And I'll be tweeting about that real soon. So I uh, will see everyone later and have a good week.